Next, Encore Book Notes with Betty Bao Lord. We talked with her in 1990 about her book, Legacies, a Chinese Mosaic. The collection of biographical stories tell of life in China during the Cultural Revolution and up until Tiananmen Square. Mrs. Lord left China at the age of eight, but returned in 1985 with her husband, then American ambassador to China, Winston Lord. As I write, meaning as you're writing your book, I am nostalgic for China. Yes. Uh, what, what made you want to say that in the middle of this book? Well, because uh, I start the book by saying I'm ready to go home, come back to America. We had lived in China for three and a half years, and while it was wonderful, uh, I needed the space and that only American can give in, in the sense that my schedule would be my own and that I uh, could get away from all the uh, so many things I had been hearing in China and seeing but when you're up close it's hard to to really put some perspective on it so I was so ready to go home but as I was writing the book and writing about my friends and writing about China I became nostalgic so I guess it proves that we're never satisfied uh, Many times I wish uh, that we could been, be in two places at once. Why the title uh, Legacies, a Chinese mosaic? Well, Legacies uh, it refers to the cultural, the political legacies that the Chinese people carry on their shoulders every day, today. And then a Chinese mosaic refers to the stories that I tell about the Chinese people. Each one is a separate story. And they put together as a mosaic. I hope we'll give the reader a picture of China today. You often cite in the book and your characters cite in the book, um, the people you're writing mm -hmm. about, the Cultural Revolution. Yes. Would you try to explain what the Cultural Revolution was? The Cultural Re Revolution uh, spanned the decade of 1966 to 1976. It was a time, I think, when Mao wanted to revitalize the revolution. I think he felt that somehow the revolution had become bureaucratized and he wanted to stir up the feelings of people for change again. And he could do this only by stirring up the young people. He told them that they were the true revolutionaries, not the party leaders that ran the country. But, uh, and so he unleashed young people from teenagers to college students to go out, do as they will, and make revolution. Uh, that they only had to read his little red book, uh, follow him and they could remake China into a better China. Well, of course, this caused tremendous chaos because young people uh, spurred by the fury of radical ideology are capable of all things. And so many things uh, happened because of their their belief in Mao and their belief that they were capable of remaking China into a better country. Did you ever meet Mao? I did not meet Mao, but of course my husband, Winston, uh, met Mao about five times on five separate trips to China. He had seen him, uh, he'd been traveling to China since the early 70s, since the secret trip he made with Dr. Kissinger. What was Mao's um, I want to say claim to fame. That's not the right question. What was he all about? I think he was a visionary. I think that he was a man who wanted to rid China of the foreigner. And he wanted to put China uh, on the map. I think he was quite successful in getting people 
to follow him and to support his ideas before the 50s. But I think this is always the problem with uh, people who stay in power too long. They, they lose their abilities to judge. And uh, uh, just as he stayed too long in power, uh, so has Deng Xiaoping. Because both men, as uh, leaders of their country, did many great things. But in the end, they stay too long. How did you approach writing this book? Ah, I, I wanted to write on several levels. Uh, the, I start each chapter with, the, with just a headline about what happened during the seven weeks of China Spring last year. And then afterwards, I would, if that is the sort of the frame of this book, if this is the mosaic we're talking about, that I would say would be the frame. And then I would go on and tell something about myself or my family. And that perhaps would be the glue. And the mosaic pieces are the stories of my friends. I to give them a context, to give them a frame for the reader to read the stories, not just as stories uh, of individuals, but of the Chinese uh, people uh, doing China Spring. When you open the book mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning, yes. and you come to this page here, and we're going to see if we can get a close-up of this, um, you see this symbol, and you talk about uh, here that this symbol suggests that uh, there are other voices speaking. Yes. You don't realize that it, it, it kind of takes over the book at some point, and you see this symbol a lot. What is, what's the purpose of it? Well, because I wrote these stories as in the first person. Because in many ways, I feel that ha had I never left China as a child, I could have been any one of those 20 people that I write about. So I write as if I were them. And therefore, I use the I. Well, yeah, here's the page in the scholar. And uh, right in the middle of the page, uh, you see this symbol. And I uh, want to ask you, who was the scholar? Uh, I don't know who the scholar is. It's one of, there are two chapters um, in this book where I'm not sure who they are because they're people I've never met. Uh, during the time that I was in China, I had asked many people if I could interview them. And many of them agreed. Others who had heard from friends and friends that I was doing so would send me tapes with their stories. And the scholar, was after my farewell party. I had gotten a whole bunch of presents uh, from friends who had come there, and among them were some tapes. And the scholar, uh, apparently, there was no beginning, there was no end, there was no name, there was nothing except a voice speaking to me for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> and that's uh, one of the most moving stories, I think, because here's a man that lost his right to be a man because of politics. How? Um, when he was a young man, he was sent to help with the uh, land reform program. And while he was there, he was asked to uh, designate certain people in the village as landlords. But there were no people in his particular district who were actually landlords. So he said he thought that the party could not possibly mean for him to name somebody who, was not, who did not fit the category. So he did not. And then the orders at that time went down that, up to, that most people had to name about 5% of their district as landlords. And he could not name one, and he didn't. As a result, he was named uh, as an enemy of the people. And he was sent to uh, hard labor. 
While he was at hard labor, they had a, a propaganda troupe, uh, a musical and comedy kind of uh, propaganda uh, group. And because he was a musician, he was asked to participate in, in the programs. But they needed him to be a woman. And so they made him a woman. Not only did they make him play a woman on stage, but they wouldn't cut his hair. So his hair grew very, very long. And they dressed him. They only gave him clothes of a woman to wear. And he had no choice but to wear women's clothes, wear his hair long, and be a woman for all extensive uh, purposes. Uh, if you looked at him quickly, you couldn't tell. And he was forced to uh, take that role for many, many, many years. And later, during the Cultural Revolution, when uh, his wife was made to divorce him, he had uh, a terrible setback, a terrible nervous breakdown. And during that nervous breakdown, he somehow reverted to talking to his wife as if she were there. And then one day, she, he started to put on her clothes. And while he put on her clothes, he went out outdoors and uh, went to the, uh, the, the uh, public toilet. And mistakenly, of course, went into the men's toilet, at which point he was, he was shooed out. And then there was no choice for him except to go to the women's toilet. And when he went to the women's toilet, the women screamed, of course. He didn't, he didn't, he was out of it by that time. He didn't really understand what happened. And as a result of that, he was put back in jail for, for sexual crimes. So this man sent me the story. But what is amazing about this man is that uh, he had written a book of poetry that analyzed uh, the poetry of the ancients. And he eventually uh, regained his, his position as a teacher. And he retired uh, at the age of 70 uh, as a teacher. How did he find you? I think he must have known a lot of our mutual friends who I had been interviewing. And it was very funny because I had not uh, interviewed anybody with the point of view of how the politics had affected uh, femininity or masculinity. And it was toward the very end when I was probing for this particular problem that I would tell my friends I'm looking for someone who I could interview on this particular subject about marriage, uh, about being spinsters, about divorce. Uh, and as usually when, when I asked my friends to do this, I would then get back, well, we found someone for you, or let me introduce you to another friend. But when I asked about this particular problem, I think it was quite late in my stay, and it was my farewell party, and I think they, they felt that I did not, not have time to interview him, and he just sent it anonymously to me. You had twenty. You have twenty people that you write about, mm -hmm. and and you also <clears throat> we listen to their voices through what they had to say in, in your book. How many did you decide? I mean, how many how many were in front of you that and you had to whittle it down to twenty? Oh, many, many. I think I have about five hundred hours of tapes. <laughs> what have you done with those tapes? I I plan to eventually give them to a, uh, a library of oral history. Are they all in Chinese? Yes. <laughs> Somebody will have to learn. But I think it will be very valuable for historians many, many years from now. You were born in China? Yes. Shanghai? Shanghai. Are you, for all intents and purposes, fluent in Chinese? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. how, how did you keep your language? Well, I didn't. I had to relearn it. I came here when I was eight years old. At that time, my parents thought we would be going back to China. And so practically from the moment that I landed here, they started speaking to me in English. They put me in school the second day I was in America. Uh, 
thinking that I, if I stayed a year or two here, I would go back fluent in English. They spent so much time teaching me English and stuffing English into my head. As a child of eight, the other just popped out. And it wasn't until I was ready for college, almost a year before I went to college, that I realized that it was being so stupid that uh, all the time that my parents uh, spoke to me in Chinese, I always replied out of habit in English that, w that I would have to make uh, a try to, re to relearn Chinese. And of course, because I had heard it for so many years, uh, it was not hard. But learning to read and write was harder. <laughs> parents still alive? Yes, yes, yes. Why did they come here in the first place? My father was assigned after the war to come and buy equipment for China. He was an engineer. He, he is an engineer. And where did you move to? Brooklyn. Why Brooklyn? Well, it was after the war in 1946. Housing was really a problem. My father worked, I think, uh, near downtown New York. And uh, that was the, the place where he found a place for us to live. What do you most remember about your upbringing around the New York area? Yeah, uh, in Brooklyn. Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> Long time ago. Well, yes, that's true. Um, I felt that my Americanization really uh, happened because I became a Dodger fan. Once I became a Dodger fan and rooted for Jackie Robinson, all the kids accepted me. <laughs> Was it difficult being Chinese and growing up in white America? You're not going to believe this, and nobody else is going to believe it. And I think all, a lot of people are going to write me letters. But no, I didn't. I didn't find, I found uh, in PS number eight, I learned to speak English with a teacher named Mrs. Rappaport. She was wonderful. Infinite patience, uh, exacting. Uh, as I said, once I learned how to speak English, once I learned how to play the American games, uh, I didn't find it troublesome at all. And how many people in your family, brothers and sisters? My, I have two sisters, and my father and mother are here. And you write about both your sisters in your book. Yes, yes. And how many people in your family are back in China? All the rest. How many is that, roughly? Oh, I don't know. I've never counted, but when my parents came to, to Beijing the, f uh, the first time, we had a family reunion of people who are my relatives just in Beijing alone of 60. And that doesn't count the other towns. You grew up in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to college? I went to college at uh, Tufts University and graduate school at uh, Fletcher School of Law, Law and Diplomacy. Remember in reading the book, the, the dates I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was 1946 that you came here mm -hmm. to the United States. Mm -hmm. You first returned in 73? That's right. And what was the purpose of that visit? I wanted to see China. I wanted to see my relatives. Uh, Winston had gone, had been making several trips, many trips, and I was anxious to see what had happened. Before you had talk about the trip back there, where did you meet Winston Lord? At graduate school. And that was where? Uh, that was at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And he, believe it or not, on a dance floor, the first thing he asked me was the question that you had asked me before. Did, had I encountered racial prejudice growing up in America? And what year did you meet him? In 1959. When did you marry? 1963. And what was it about the two of you that you know, growing up in a mixed family in this country, what made it easy for you? Not, I mean, what, in other words, what, why the marriage? What, what why was the marriage? Attraction? Well, I, uh, <laughs> we have a very odd, odd, uh, it's not your, your, your uh, run-of-the-mill or mixed marriages. As a matter of fact, uh, both my parents, uh, both my parents-in-laws and my own parents, if we ever had a fight, Winston and I would probably take the other side. So we were both welcomed into each other's family. And I think that makes a big, big difference when two people of different backgrounds marry. After you married, where did you, married, where did you live? Washington. And what did uh, your husband Winston do? Winston was a foreign service officer. Where was he assigned? Uh, Washington. 
the whole time? Uh, no. Uh, we were here for about three or, four, three or four years, and then we went overseas to Geneva. And in the um, opening of the book, you have list your other literary yes. achievements. One of them is fiction, <clears throat> Spring Moon. When yes. did you write that, and what was that? I wrote the novel Spring Moon in, I finished it in 1981. That's when it was published. It took me six years to write. Uh, it's a story, it's a novel about China from really covering the time that China had been trying to modernize, really since the late 19th century to the 70s, as told, uh, as seen through the eyes of a woman named Spring Moon, who starts out in life with bound feet and not being able to leave the garden walls of the homestead, and uh, then takes part in, in the political turmoil of China. And then the second listing is a nonfiction book called Eighth Moon. What was that? Eighth Moon is actually my first book. I wrote that when my sister San San uh, left China in 1961 and uh, 1962. Uh, when she arrived in, in America, we had been separated for 17 years. I had seen her last when she was about a six-month-old baby and met her at the airport and coming down the runway was a 17-year-old girl that was my sister. I started, of course, to catch up with all those years and I found myself fascinated by her life, so different from my own and yet quite typical of a young person growing up in China during the revolutionary period, uh, right after the liber uh, liberation of China by the communists. So I wanted somebody to write the story because in the 60s, uh, people knew very little about China. And people usually had opinions about China colored by their politics, whether they were pro-Taiwan or pro-mainland. But here was a story of a young girl who saw the changes without any political axe to grind and told from a very simple story of growing up. I tried to find somebody to write the story, but I knew of no writers who could speak Chinese. So being 23 and quite foolish, I didn't know what it was to write a book. And I decided to quit my job and give it a, a try. What were you doing then? I was working with the Fulbright Exchange Program. And how did the book do? It did quite well for a first book. It was translated into about, uh, I think, 18 languages. It was a Reader's Digest condensed book. Uh, but I paid for this ease in which I wrote because I didn't write for almost 10, 12 years. I was scared to again, because somehow I felt that people would find me out as an imposter. After I wrote Eighth Moon, I started going to the drugstore, <laughs> picking up all those magazines on how to break into publishing, or how to become a writer, and how to write memoirs, or biographies and started reading them. They scared me half to death. I didn't do any of the things that they had told me to do. And so surely I felt that if I wrote again, people would find me out as uh, not a writer at all, not a genuine writer. So I was too scared to write. Where's, and I didn't write until, until Spring Moon. Where is San San today? San San's working in Washington. You have another book uh, to your credit for children in the year of the boar and Jackie Robinson. When, yes. When did you write that and what I, was it? I wrote that after Spring Moon. It was um, a story that I had tried to tell uh, in an article for some magazine. But when I wrote it from the adult point of view, it didn't seem to work. Because my life has been rather free of conflict and, and uh, disappointments. So the heart of a novel, the heart of anything an adult 
writes about is conflict, is struggle. And somehow when I wrote it, it didn't work. But suddenly then I thought about writing it from a child's point of view, which would not reflect upon the credibility of the teller. And that's when I wrote it, a uh, fictionalized version of my first year in America. And instead of as Betty Bao Lord, uh, Betty Bao, uh, as Shirley Temple Wong. <laughs> Um, one of the stories you tell in the book, uh, I'd like to have you share with us, mm -hmm. and that's the story that when <clears throat> uh, you were going to become a diplomat's wife. Yes. <laughs> and, and and you had to you had to go through a process with the State Department yes. with, a, with what's called a GS-15, <clears throat> Mr. Schultz, I believe. Mr. Zluck. <clears throat> uh, tell us about it. Yes. Him. Well, as you know, when Foreign Service officers marry any foreign national the foreign national has to go through uh, a security check, which is understandable. But in addition to that, uh, they have to meet with somebody uh, in the government, uh, I guess, to, to see whether, at that, uh, whether the fiancé would aptly represent the United States of America. Well, in most times, uh, the most people who go in for such a test are asked who's the President of the United States and uh, uh, can you sing the first line of the Star Spangled Banner and uh, that's about it. So I didn't take it very, very seriously. I had uh, grown up here, I had gone to college, I had a master's degree, I didn't think there was any problem. So I went to see Mr. Zluck and I don't understand to this day why Mr. Zluck gave me a two-hour test that uh, was harder than I think what Winston took or anybody else took to get into the Foreign Service. Here I was just going in as a wife. Um, the first question he asked me very, very seriously was, who is Vardis Fisher? Do you know? No. Did you have the, an did you have the answer? I didn't have the answer, and nobody I've asked since then has been <laughs> able to tell me who Vardis Fisher is. <laughs> Well, and here you are running a book program. You mean to tell me you don't know who Vardis did Fisher you ever find is? Out? Yes, I did. Who uh, is he? He is a writer of the Oregon Trail. You see? Should know that. You have been enlightened. But and then <clears throat> I was asked to uh, give this. My husband said that I should have been able to answer this one. Uh, the starting lineup of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> And there were a lot of other strange questions yes, that he asked. Yes, yes. Why, um, why does it matter who a diplomat for the United States, uh, why does it matter who his or her spouse is? Well, uh, I think the rules have changed quite a bit since, uh, since the early 60s. But I think it was left over from the war when, 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 when people were, uh, I can only assume that they were marrying uh, a lot of foreigners who then had to assume responsibilities and duties as the wife of a diplomat. But uh, in the 70s, uh, you no longer have to, uh, to make your wife a partner in your career. Uh, before the 1972 directive in the State Department, women, uh, wives or spouses at that time, let's face it, women, of foreign service officers were graded in the officer's efficiency report. They were not paid. They, they were not even employed. But this was part of the old uh, system. Did you work all through the period there, besides writing your books that uh, say from your husband went to China in 71 and you yes. went in 73. Mm -hmm. What did you do from 73 to now, or, mm -hmm. or 73 to the time you mm -hmm. went there? I used to be a dancer. I used to dance with the Washington uh, dancers and repertory here in Washington. I taught dance. I also uh, worked with the Associated Council of the Arts and, um, and wrote. Were you assigned to any other foreign post besides Geneva? No, before you because, went to... because Winston left the Foreign Service after five years. So after the Geneva Post, he left the Foreign Service, although he continued on working in the 
uh, area of foreign policy. I remember another day, I think, that you went back to China in 79? Yes. What was that trip for? Uh, to see family again. I went in 75 when I could not see family. It was a pretty s tense period in, in um, bilateral relations at that time. So I went in with Winston on an official trip, and I had hoped to spin off from them. But uh, the atmosphere was quite chilly, so I didn't stay. Did and then I went back in 79. Did people know when they saw you in China that you were not, that it's hard to know that you're an American citizen, but they know you were not living there. I mean, could they yes. tell right away? Well, I don't think they can tell now because people have changed their way of dress. But in 1971, when I first went, there were very, very few tourists at all in China. And even though I tried to dress as closely as possible to the people in the street, nevertheless, they could tell by my shoes or by the fact that I wore a, a wedding band uh, that I didn't come from, uh, that I was not a native Chinese anymore. And it was very odd going through the streets. Hundreds of people would follow me everywhere. Why? Because I looked different. I may not look different to you, but I look different to them. I was a curiosity. Page 120. Mm -hmm. The journalist was mm -hmm. is the title of the chapter. Chinese go through life wearing masks. Yes. The ones that tradition decrees, the ones that society decrees, and since liberation, the ones that the party decrees. Yes. Did did you have a mask when you? I mean, do you? Yes, I I uh, I tried not to have a mask because uh, I wanted to get because to be friends, to get close to people. But there are certain times when you do have to, to put on a mask, especially as a diplomat's wife. Um, you have to pretend you're angry when you're, when, when you're not. You have to pretend you're happy when you're not. You have to, there are a lot of things you have to do. Do Americans have masks? Not as much. Americans uh, have been taught to shoot from the hip, to tell it the way it is. Um, to, uh, to be much more straightforward because they represent only themselves. Americans are raised as individuals. Chinese have responsibilities to the family, to the clan, to the country, and uh, uh, it's a different way of thinking. So that if you make a fool of yourself, I'm not likely to blame your son or your father. I would just think, oh, you made a fool of yourself. But Chinese usually link it all together. And so you have, you have, you have additional burdens to be good. Is there any way to describe what life is like for the average Chinese out of the 1.2 billion or whatever the number is? Well, there's no, I can tell you what it's like in the cities. Uh, usually they have a uh, living space in Beijing, at least, in the big cities, of less than the size, an individual has a living space less than the size of a double bed. It's very, very, the space is very, very confined. And still there are a lot of housing problems for them. So living in a tight space also calls upon putting on masks. Um, and there are many times when two or three generations have to share an apartment. And then again, you have to pretend that uh, you like your mother-in-law very, very much, because if you didn't, you couldn't live together. <laughs> so that, that's where the masks come in. And the government usually assigns you to your work and your schooling. Uh, uh, during the decade of reforms, there have been other outlets but more and more, it involved using the back door, using connections, and uh, the system had become more and more corrupt, so that uh, knowing someone who can pull strings uh, was a great help in life, because otherwise you couldn't get things done. In fact, I once had to uh, indulge in corruption. It involved getting a car phone for Winston. 
um, we were told that for the ambassador's car to have a car phone, it would take three and a half years. <laughs> so then I was told that if I could get somehow two tickets for an Alan de Leon concert for this Chinese who gave out these car phones for the government, that somehow, miraculously, Winston would then have a car phone. So I went around and uh, got two, car two tickets for an Alan de Leon concert at the Workers' Stadium for this woman. And sure enough, the next day, we got the car phone. I felt, I felt very guilty about it because this is the kind of small corruptions that leads to big corruptions. But on the other hand, Winston was in the car going to the airport or elsewhere at least one or two hours a day, which meant that he was out of touch with the, uh, with the office. And I, I guess I rationalized that it was important. You say that you're, I remember reading that your husband was proud to say that he'd been to all 23 districts in China. Uh, provinces, yes. Provinces. But you were glad that you didn't have to make every one of those trips? Yes. Why? I'm a, I love to sit and talk to people. I'm not a great uh, tourist. I prefer getting to know the people. And usually when I am with Winston and touring, we usually don't get to really know people. We get to, to go to banquets and talk on official subjects. And uh, I usually have to do a lot of the translation, at least, uh, uh, and, and I find that it's less, landscapes are less interesting to me than people. And he could speak, what, you say, pidgin Mandarin? <laughs> yes. Well, this is because when he started out as a Foreign Service officer, because he had married a Chinese national, the State Department told him that he would never have anything to do. He, could, he would be barred from participating in China policy because of his marriage to a Chinese. That rule, of course, was changed later. But at the time, uh, when he was uh, learning languages, uh, he thought, why learn Chinese if I could never use it professionally. I'm going to read uh, a, a little bit. Say, unlike the peripatetic Winston, <laughs> what did you mean by peripatetic Winston? He loves to travel. I was raised in a family in which having a wonderful holiday meant sitting at the kitchen table drinking tea, mm -hmm. nibbling watermelon seeds, and talking. Father, mother, and I would often linger there from breakfast until long after the witching hour. Yes, yes. Talking? Talking, talking. My father and mother are great storytellers. And so I was, uh, the pleasures for me have always been conversation. And uh, because we had no other family but each other here in the States, uh, I often sit and they would tell me about my grandparents, uh, my other relatives in China. I'm very lucky that they did. Otherwise, I don't think I could write about China with the, uh, with the facility that I can uh, without those stories, without somehow feeling that I had lived them too. Americans are self-selected breed programmed by their genes to be forever on the go and cursed by the fates <laughs> never to enjoy luxuriating in the material comforts and spiritual splendors of home. Now, you have to say that that's an I was, I was try making fun of both sides, and that's the way I make fun of Americans. Uh, <clears throat> the opposite, you know, Americans, I think, in many ways, are a, a self-selected breed. We're a country of immigrants. If we didn't want to move, and if we didn't want to seek, uh, push back the horizons, uh, we would not come to America from all over the world. Those of us who have come, uh, some, for most of us, it's not an easy trip. I don't mean in terms of transportation. I mean leaving one culture, going to another, starting over. These are difficult things. I mean, and then what amazes me most about the American spirit is the spirit that uh, had people go and settle the West, where people lived hundreds of miles away from each other. Um, for people who like to sit at the kitchen table, 
it's it's difficult. You also talk about language. You say after a while the American side slumbered, however, unable to appreciate how the mere act of speaking in Chinese <laughs> confers so much satisfaction that what is said hardly matters. <laughs> what about language? Is yes. it uh, which one is harder? Uh, Chinese or, or English? Chinese perhaps is easier to speak, except for the fact of tones. Maybe not take it back. Let's say English. I think English is easier. 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 A there, language. There's such a dramatic difference. There's such a dramatic difference. Uh, Chinese is easier grammatically because you can toss words up together and they some, somehow fall, fall together. There's, n there's less grammar. There's less grammar. But then there's the problem of tones, which the same sound with the four different tones can mean totally something else. As I read the book, I saw you jumping back and forth, Chinese American, Chinese American yes. language, uh, customs, yes. masks. Where yes. are you now in your own <laughs> head? Mm. I, it depends on the occasion. I think now when I'm with Chinese, after living there three and a half years, uh, I feel very much at home with them. But of course, when I'm here in America, I also feel very much at home here. I think it's uh, it's a choice now for me. The, uh, the two parts have never been at war with one another. So uh, I think I'm doubly blessed. This is the book, Legacies, a, China, a Chinese Mosaic. Betty Ballard is our guest. We're talking about a book she completed in what month last year? Uh, in the end of October. How much of your experience during the Tiananmen Square happenings uh, did you want to write about in this book? Uh, I actually did not go into the square except one evening. Uh, although I was not uh, any longer the ambassador's wife. Uh, Winston had left the country. Uh, I had been hired by CBS to be a consultant actually on the Gorbachev visit in January and I had returned to China to work for them. But I was re I am recognizable in China so I did not want to become a part of the story thinking that if I went into the square and was recognized uh, that I would become part of the story. So I only went once at night and another time when we were doing 48 hours with uh, Dan Rather when I was standing on a truck so I wasn't part of the crowd. Uh, most of Legacies is not about my participation except that what I saw, I saw people who were suddenly together as a community. I'd been in China for three and a half years and it was becoming less and less a community and people were out of sorts all the time uh, because of the frustrations of life and yet during those seven weeks when the students uh, marched for a fairer society and against corruption Everybody was nice to each other in a way that was just wonderful. Perhaps it's like New York after a blackout. Perhaps it's like San Francisco after an earthquake. Suddenly, neighbors became friends and people were helping each other. And so I was very privileged to be there and to see that. Uh, I would guess that you and your husband and friends sit around and talk about where China is going and where it will be. Yes. What's your best guess 10 years from now? I think China will always have a difficult time uh, uh, with solving the problems of a billion people. It's poor, uh, it's education has been neglected. But I do feel that sometime soon there will be a much more open and a much more progressive government in China. How soon? Oh, within the next two to five years. And why do you, why do you predict that? Because the people who have, who ordered the soldiers to shoot at the students destroyed their own myth that they had worked so hard to create, which was 
really the, one of the founding pillars of the Communist Party, that the People's Army would not shoot at its own people because the warlord armies did and because they said that Kuomintang armies did and other people did, but not the, the uh, People's Army. But this time, everybody saw that they had done so. And really, for, for no reason, the, 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 the problem could have been solved by attrition very easily. When I left China two or three days before June 3rd and 4th, the weekend of the massacre, there were hardly any people left in the square. People were leaving. And if they had waited another week, I think the crisis would have been over. Even if the government felt that they had to clear the square by, by a show of force, they could have done it in other ways than tanks and bullets. In 1976, when the despicable gang of four, who everybody in the world knows about, uh, that uh, their, the horrors that they have committed, and which every Chinese would despise, even they, when clearing Tiananmen Square in 1976, when citizens went into the square to uh, object to them, they did it by spraying water, not bullets. Are you going to go back? I will go back when there's a different China than there is today when it's not so oppressive. When I can feel that I can meet my friends and not get them into trouble. When I can feel that if somebody takes my picture there, it's not going to be used for propaganda purposes. Is that a special problem for you because you're Chinese, originally from China, or would you say that to all Americans that they ought to stay out of China? No, I think it's my, uh, my I think businessmen who have businesses there uh, should conduct business. I think, um, I think if you're a tourist, it would depend on whether you have other chances to go to China in the future. Um, no, this is only a decision for myself. One of the things that seemed unusual when I read your book was that um, uh, it, I guess I just didn't expect it. At one point you say, I'm write, sitting here writing in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Wyoming. Yes. yes. Why did you pick that? Well, I felt that I needed the peace and quiet uh, of the mountains. Um, I didn't, I had just, I didn't want to go through the getting settled back into the apartment at the same time as writing a book that I wanted to, to write very much and as quickly as I could. So going into the mountains was a great help. It did work then? It worked. Um, with the 500, you say, hours of tape you've got? Yeah. All in Chinese? Yes. Did you translate it all? No. What I, uh, what I did was I had some help in the transcribing. But as you know, tapes, uh, sometimes I would have um, 12 hours of tapes for which uh, I would use only a little bit of it. Uh, some of the chapters are quite small. I think none of the stories go on beyond 15 pages. So, uh, but the, the transcription that was done from the tapes was done with, by, by a group of uh, people other than myself. Is there another book that you want to bring out of these, all these tapes you've got? Um, I think uh, my next book will be a novel like Spring Moon. I uh, started a novel before I went to, to Beijing as ambassador's wife, um, and I still have to finish that one, so that one will come next. Which one of the 20 did do you, or if, not, maybe not your favorite, but which one of the 20 um, means the most to you, the characters you write about? Oh, it's so hard to, to select, but I suppose there are only two women uh, among the 20. And I suppose I would pick the woman that, uh, the story of the actress, because uh, it is so heartbreaking. And yet, I feel that uh, she has survived her trials magnificently. She is today a wonderful actress and someone who brings many hours of pleasure to the Chinese people. So even though she went through hell, personal hell, 
because at the age of seven, she didn't know better than to uh, that the government could be wrong. Because when the government told her that her father was an enemy, she believed it. Were you able to name any of your characters? I, mean, you, I noticed and say the stories I tell are true, and because they are, I had no choice but disguise the people who live them. Is that everybody? Yes. In the book? Yes. Yes. Would the Chi from what you know, the Chinese government will they take your book and go over it with a fine tooth comb and try to locate some of these folks? No, these stories are not. These stories are the stories that were told to me personally, so that they have depth and feeling. But these stories are very common, because the communists do not look at you as a person. They look at you as an intellectual, a worker, or a farmer. They put you in categories. And the fate of people within that category are pretty much the same. So even though individually they reacted to their uh, to the various political campaigns differently, um, nevertheless, their stories are quite typical. They're not unusual. So I would think it would be quite hard to pin down who exactly I'm writing about. What, what kind of a grade would you give? Uh, forget the politics of, of China. And mm -hmm. if you found yourself having to run 1.2 billion people. What kind of a grade would you give the administrative function in China right now of keeping track of all those people and collecting taxes and and paying them and uh, I, I think that I think that the organization the network is very very deep and thick uh, there are many many places bureaucracy is incredible it's not just the communists uh, China invented bureaucracy <laughs> Um, but what has happened is it, the, the system is very comprehensive. But what has happened is every point of this comprehensive system, the person has become corrupt in the sense of the tax collector will collect taxes from you, but not from a friend. The tax collector will will trade uh, how much tax you have to pay for um, a, a favor in return. So I would I would say the system is not working, and that is why the people marched. Uh, this is kind of jump. This is mm -hmm. the, may not fit together, but I think you'll get what, I, what I'm getting at. It is also true that at every step along the way, somebody always darted out and squeezed them. The neighbor down the road who now charged for the use of that road, the village headman who withheld fertilizer for favors, the local party secretary who fixed the quota of grain they must sell at artificially low prices to the state. Now peasants joke that at least when the landlord used to whip them three times a day, they could withstand the prescribed ordeal because they could count on what was to follow. Uh, is that all that kind of treatment of your fellow person, is that all a, a factor of this system that's over there? Or is it the Chinese people? No, I think it's, it's, been, it's, it's, um, it's when people are frustrated. When you and I can't get things done, uh, you, perhaps if our money were, uh, if we could not walk in the front door of a store to get what we wanted to do, Eventually, if we needed what was in that store uh, uh, badly enough, you and I would find out who works in that store. And then, is there somebody we know who knows these people? And can I give them uh, a call and get them to take me to the store so that I can get the thing that I need? It's not something so terrible that's incomprehensible. It's because people, because the party makes so many decisions for the people that they can't seem to manage to, to, to uh, manage their, their destiny. So more and more people find other ways, underhanded ways, under the table ways, connection, making connections to resolve these problems. Um, another line is, uh, 
if the United States, with its legacy of an open society and a free press, could be reshaped by the small screen, imagine its impact on China. You're talking about television. Yes. What kind of control, I mean, what kind of television do the people of China have today? Uh, I think there are almost 200 million sets there. And uh, people in the cities have them. And at least villages would have one in which everybody would sort of come around and, and take a look at. So the net, again, the, syst the dissemination through television is, is very good. It's very good. Uh, they have one channel? No, they have uh, three channels three channels. But they they do not put only Chinese programs on their channels because they can't afford to. They have uh, many programs that, that they have bought from the United States. For instance, Hunter is a regular program in China. So is Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Walt Disney, uh, other pictures. So they, they bought, I think, from CBS over 200 old movies, which are shown. Um, and uh, Little House on the Prairie was the biggest hit in China, too. What impact did that have on the society? Tremendous impact. Tremendous impact. Because that particular program is about a, a, an American family who sticks together, who have differences, who have generational problems, and yet they have somehow worked it out amicably. And it was a great surprise to the Chinese who had been taught through propaganda for years and years and years that Americans don't care about family. This is what the book looks like. It's in your bookstores and it's on the bestseller list. Legacies, a Chinese mosaic by Betty Bao Lord, our guest for the past hour. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. About a year after our 1990 interview with Betty Bao Lord, Fawcett Books published this paperback version of her book, Legacies. Fawcett is a division of Random House at 201 East 50th Street, New York, New York, 10022. Ms. Lord has written other books, including Spring Moon, Eighth Moon,